Okay. He really wanted to be here, but we'll get him. Yeah. All right. Well, I've turned the recording on. We'll go ahead and turn the time over to Joe. Cool. Okay. Let me turn on my... Uh... Joe, what are you really going to call the title? I had to make one up for you. Um, I like to call it Shave Like Your Grandpa. Oh, okay. that's right. I wondered if I, I was going to put that in. You told me that. And then I thought I was making that up. Okay. No, that's good. Um, so it may seem like kind of a funny topic, how to shave, because we've all been shaving, you know, since like we were eight years old, right? <laughs> Maybe since we were 18. Um, but, uh, the thing is, is that there's a way for shaving to be a chore. And there's a way for shaving to be an enjoyable experience. And traditional wet shaving is one of those things that, that really is kind of an enjoyable experience. Um, the problem though, is that it takes time. Um, it takes a little bit of equipment and it takes some skill. Um, it took me a good year, maybe year and a half before I really felt like I had a handle on things. Um, it, it, uh, it's one of those things that you learn quick, but master slowly. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot of things like this, the, the day-to-day -day things that um, over time, uh, man has come up with um, better, simpler, faster, easier ways of doing things. For example, fountain pens. How many of us actually use a fountain pen regularly? Um, not many because the ballpoint pen was invented. The reason why is because fountain pens require an additional amount of skill. Um, they're prone to messes. Um, they're difficult to use. It's the same thing with shaving, um, you know, and we end up, I had to dig in the drawer to find this thing. We end up with these kind of monstrosities with like 12 blades on them. And it's become a chore. If you're like me, I used to have this hanging on a little hook in the shower and I got to where I wasn't even using shaving cream anymore. It was just a quick two minutes, if that, you know, and boom, 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 done, go on you know, because our days are just so rushed. You have to finish this, get it out of the way, and move on to something else. Uh, my brother introduced me to wet shaving, and the way he introduced it to me was, okay, this is, you know what, as, as a husband and a father, you know, as someone who, who kind of our existence is providing for others, um, our day is, is going to work, provide for the family, put food on the table, fix stuff around the house, fix the cars, you know, just going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And traditional shaving is a time for you to slow down and actually enjoy part of what it, what it means to be a man. Hopefully none of our wives are shaving, at least not their faces. So this is a uniquely male experience. And if you do it right, you can enjoy it. So, um, a, a well done shave, plan on 15 minutes. Um, it, it does take some time. Um, so first you, you need some tools. Um, to start off with, you need a mug and really just about any mug will do. I like these, I bought this at either Savers or DI. It's an old soup mug with this handle that makes it easy to hold. Um, this one is actually made specifically for shaving. I don't use it much. You can tell because of all the, the dust inside. I just prefer, I prefer this one. So any old mug will do. Put that back, you need a brush. This is my badger brush. Um, you need a razor. That's a fat brush. Was that a specialty brush? I haven't, that, I don't, that's a fat one. I mean, it's got lots of bristles. Brush. Yeah, you're, you're right, boy. That is a fairly fat brush. This is a fat knot that, that gets real wide. This, for comparison, is my mm -hmm. first brush. This one's a boar brush, and it's a good brush. This is a really good brush. This is, I mean, this is cheap. This is like a $7 brush. Um, this is made out of badger hair. It's a little more expensive. I really don't like the handle on this one, it's just too thick. I really prefer this handle. And I toy around with pulling this knot out and putting it in a new handle sometime. Um, but uh, that'll come some other time. Um, so you need a brush. Actually, let me show you. This is my dad's old badger brush compared to the boar brush. I've never used this. Pop's not with us anymore. So this isn't for shaving with, this is for sitting on a shelf and, and being sentimental. 
Listen, though, I mean, wouldn't you kind of get a connection with him if you just like used it once? You know what? Just That's a connection. I mean, it's a man experience, right? Yes. Father to son. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of that. I like that thought. I really like that thought. Um, you need a razor. Um, this is where, between this and the brush, this is where you're going to spend some money. This razor, uh, it, it's called the Gillette Red Tip. It's an old classic razor. This razor was made in 1954. It has been this specific razor. It was made in the fourth quarter of 1954. So it's been shaving faces for almost 70 years. Uh, in comparison, this one I bought brand new a few years ago. This is a German made razor, very good razor. So you can buy classic razors, you can buy modern razors. This one, I don't have a date on. I think mid thirties, the, uh, the patent stamp on it is 1920. Um, but I, I use this razor from time to time. It's a bit aggressive, so I have to be in the mood. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that if you've got good equipment, it'll stick around for a good long time. Uh, in addition to a, a razor, you need a blade. Um, this is just uh, an old, look at that, almost can't see it. An old double-edged safety, uh, safety razor. Double-edged safety razor is what these are called. So a double-edged blade is what you use in here. Um, and what makes need... it safe? What's a dangerous one? The kind yep. you put in the, the lateral ones? If that's a safety razor, what's not safe? Let's see. That is okay. not safe. Okay, got it. Wait, because so do they call it a razor because it's razor sharp or razor thin or because it goes on the tool that's a razor? Uh, that's a good question, Andrew. I don't know. I've always called this the razor and this, this the blade. I guess you could call this a razor blade. So I guess this is the razor. I don't know. I've never thought of that. Well, I've heard of like razor blades before, but I think of like a utility knife, a box cutting knife. I call that a razor blade. But now I'm just thinking, hey, well, maybe that's the original blade that goes on a razor and that's a razor blade. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred years ago when someone talked about a razor or a razor blade, this is the kind of blade they would have talked about. Those are cheap, right? The blades are incredibly cheap. Um, the blades, you could get blades probably as low as five cents each. Um, you could spend as much as a dollar each if you want. And I generally use a blade for about four shaves. Um, actually, probably more than that because I don't shave every day, so I forget how often I've used it. This razor, since you bring it up, Andrew, is a little different. This is called a gem, and I don't know when these were made, but this, you can see, doesn't have the second side. This is uh, this is a single edge blade, and it takes a blade. You can't see it because it's got the cover on it, but I'm sure you you recognize that kind of form factor. It's it's what used to go in a box cutter before they created the kind of trapezoid looking one. Um, this gives a, a real aggressive shave. Um, because that so, blade is a lot thicker than these other ones. So did you say you actually, there's there's blade, there's razor handles that take those box cutter blades? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, I thought they were just. And and you won't put a blade in here that you went and bought at Home Depot. You'll, okay. you'll get one specifically made for okay. a jam razor because they are a little bit thinner. Um, they're, they're made specifically for shaving. Okay. But it's that same form factor. But I mean, okay. These things, these are these are thin. They're they're, they're wobbly. In fact, yeah. What's the what's the grate on the front of all those razor blades? Like it's got the bristles or the comb almost. The comb. That's what that's what they call that. They call this an open comb razor. Okay. And that open comb actually makes this a lot more aggressive because it lets that blade get a lot closer to the skin. Whereas this, well, let's see, this one has had a blade in it. This one, there is no comb on it, 
And so this is a much milder shade. Gotcha. Um, there's open combs, there's no comb, and something in between. And I forget what they call that. Honey comb. It's where your wife does it. What's that? <laughs> no, no, I said honey comb. It's where your wife does it. <laughs> um, okay. That's so a then, bad joke. Then you need some soap. Um, and soap. Soap is where you get to have some fun. This one is called, this is one of my absolute favorite scents. This is called Sterling Gentleman, made by a company uh, in Arkansas, maybe? Boonville, Arkansas. Um, so I've, I've got, y'all, 15 or 20 soaps. Um, the soap and the aftershave is where you get to have some fun because this is where it's got a scent to it. So. You've got your mug, you've got your brush, you've got your razor, you've got your blade, you've got your soap. Um, the first thing I do, I always shave after I shower. Um, it's, you know, softened things up, gotten things ready. Um, but the other thing that does is that I'll fill the sink with hot water before I get in the shower and we'll fill, I'll fill the sink up to about this level. I'll fill my mug with hot water, let the brush soak. You can see that brush has some water in it still and and put the brush and mug down in the water that heats up the ceramic of the mug so that when i get out of the shower it's it's got some heat retent, retention it's got some heat retained in it and it's giving me going to give me a warm shave instead of a cold shave i have forgotten to do that before i much prefer a warm shave to a cold shave um so oh the other thing i do is i i set the soap to float in the water too the heat you know, opens up the essential oils, gets the smell going, gives you that scent. So you pull this out, you dump out your water, you shake your brush two or three times so that it's still wet, but not super wet. I've still got just a little bit of water down in the bottom of that mug. And this is important, building the lather. So you start, you have to build, you have to pack the brush. Let me get some of that in the mug first. But you basically just, I'm getting soap all over my counter doing this. It's like watching sausage be made. <clears throat> so you put that brush to where it's got plenty of soap in it. And if I hadn't spilled it all over my counter, would have a little more than that in the mug. And then you get to spend some time this is where you get to relax. Just kind of work this. It's like whipping egg whites. See, that's why I don't like this handle. It's too thick and not long enough for me to get down in there. So it's like whipping egg whites. It's kind of a round and also kind of a pump down to aerate this lather. And you also know it's done kind of the same way when it starts to if you can see it when it starts to peak. What do you mean by peak? Like if your egg it, white. Yeah, just like your egg whites. If it <laughs> starts to hold, see like that peak right there where it, it, I pulled the brush up and it held its form. Rex That's needs to work thing. on making some more meringue. That's your assignment this holiday is to make some egg white meringue. So you right. know what peaking is. Exactly makes a meringue. It, a good lather looks about the same. So you can see that is just about there. There you go. You've got a nice peak there. And this is a lot more messy than I usually am. Usually I don't have soap clear up to my wrist, but um, you know. So then also this is a new experience. I usually don't shave with a shirt on, but I figured you guys would appreciate. <laughs> not naked Joe. I'll have to see the manly Joe. Right. <laughs> uh, one thing some people will do, they'll continue the lather on the face. So you can do a face lather. This is better when you don't have a beard and you can go all over. You can use your whole face. And then I kind of smooth it out and put the rest back in the mug for the next round. So one of the reasons it takes some time, let me clean soap off my hands, sweat off my brow. 
One of the reasons it takes some time with wet shaving, you do three passes. The, the goal is not beard removal, but beard reduction. So, so you'll lather and shave three times. You'll go through this. The first one, so before, before you start shaving, it's important to take a good look at your face, let your beard grow out a little bit and pay attention to how it grows. Pay attention to where, where the, the grain of, of your beard goes uh, in each section of, of your face. For example, for me, my beard grows down on the face, which is pretty normal, down under the jawline, but then down on the neck, for some reason it parts ways and, and grows back on me. So my beard kind of grows down and then back. So your first pass is gonna be with the grain. And what I do is I'll, I've got two sides to the blade, one blade here, one blade there. So I'll do one section of my face. And if I don't have my beard, I'll do a full, basically this. This section of my face will be one, one side of the razor. And then I'll turn the razor around and do the other. Very light pressure. You're not pressing at all. You're just, you're just very lightly running this across your face. Rinse it Is there off. an optimal angle that you're going for? Yes. Um, it's hard to teach, though. You feel it. Huh. That's well, I feel it. That's why I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You'll, you'll feel it. Um, that's one reason it takes some time, you know, because, you know, right there, I don't have any blade. Right there, I don't have any blade. Right there, I can feel the blade. You know, there, there's, there's a, a very uh, narrow angle at which it, it works for you. And, and you'll be able to feel it, you'll hear it. That's another difference between these and, and, you know, the big modern razor is that you'll hear it. You hear it cutting the beard. Uh, um, it makes, not sandpaper, but I think that's the, the closest I can come up with right now. You'll, you'll hear it cutting the whiskers. It makes I've a cool- I've used a modern razor for a while. They, they, they're crunchy sounding too. But just maybe not as much, huh? Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you got rid of Gillette's a long time. Well, yeah, mass market Gillette's. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but maybe louder, right? Because you're right there against the whisker. Okay. Right. Yep. So, and, so Andrew, make sure you're starting on your face, not your neck. Don't, don't cut. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I wait, if somebody finds me with a pool of blood on the ground, I know I had the wrong angle. <laughs> And with the grain down here, again, one side, and then flip it and go the other side, rinse it. And then I just do one down the middle because the way my beard grows. And then I take it out. Oh, that's cool. Because if I'm going with the grain on my neck, I'm no longer going down, I'm going out. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're just rinsing it in the warm water, the hot water in the... Um... Yeah, I left the water in the sink. Okay. And so then, then do you like, like doing long strokes or smaller, shorter strokes? Longer strokes are better. Um, shorter strokes, because this blade, um, you're not as protected from the blade. If you do shorter strokes, you'll, you'll get a lot more razor burn that way. So ideally, um, you can see I still don't follow this rule, but ideally you do one light stroke one light stroke and if you've already done a spot and removed the the uh the lather then don't go back over it but you'll see me do that all the time anyway because i don't know i break the rules right <laughs> so why do you keep why do you keep flipping the razor uh because it gets loaded up um, oh, okay. It gets whiskers in it. It gets um, soap in it. Um, the same reason you rinse the razor. Um, and I don't know. I'm one of the reasons I'm a good software developer is because like I'm I'm a little OCD about things. And so you know, for me, because that's how you do it. You know, you 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 section off your face and and you do it a certain way. And if you don't do it that way, it's chaos in the universe. You know, it just. <laughs> So nice to have people admit that. Own it. So then second path, you go across the grain. 
you've, you've done your mildest pass with the grains is going to be the mildest pass. Get a little more aggressive, you go across the grain. So for me, it's like this. And I like to go from the middle out. So if I were doing my whole face, I'd start right there at the mustache, you know, and work back. So talk to us about the places you're not having to shave right now. Yeah. Which are, I mean, for me, the upper lip and the chin are particularly yep. like vulnerable to, to and lips, in fact, pretty hard to do. I mean, and so if you're doing kind of this, this, what you'd call an aggressive, what, I mean, what's a, what's a trick to not, to, to be so able to get. You'll do, a lot more, you'll do a lot more face pulling with this. Okay. If you really want to see some face pulling, start shaving with one of these. You'll, yeah. you'll real. I mean, you'll do a lot of this, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So under, under, under the, the nose, you know, the key is to get that skin tight. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm giving you all a good view, aren't I? Yep, the nose. Get that skin tight. Yeah. For the lip, the hardest part for me is the last oh. yeah. against the grain pass going up. Yeah. Um, sure. But yeah, there's there's like on the chin. What I'll do is I'll pull up to get what I can, and then I'll kind of push down to get what I can on the bottom, and that prevents me from from ever trying to shave right on you know right on the crest where that blade is really gonna be prone to dig in. Got it. So there's there's a lot of pulling the skin around to to mm -hmm. get that. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, let's see, so I did cross and then down here, cross grain. William had a question for you. Okay. Got a question for you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, William. <laughs> so would you suggest not flipping it to its side to go right along the ridge of your jawline at all? As opposed to like trying to dig it down or would just like bring it across here? Yeah, I well, I don't come forward, and that's just that's just me. That's just habit. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll usually try to pull the skin down and get under the jawline, and then pull the skin up and get above the jawline. Oh, okay, I see. I see what you're saying. Um, I thought you were pulling it to it and then pulling it from below it or something. But that's okay. Yeah, yeah. With traditional shaving, you do you make a lot more faces. It's a lot more funny to watch. <laughs> and you know, believe it or not, if you want to watch some uh, entertaining YouTube, if you want to watch a charming British guy shave twice a week, there's a well-known YouTube channel of, of a guy that, that broadcasts his shave twice Every a week. Every shave. So it's not just he one, twice you just keep that in. Every shave is... He, he broadcasts every single shave. Yeah. Yep. Paul H. Films, if you want to look him up. <laughs> His wife always has a nice flower arrangement in the bathroom that he talks about. And he's British, you know, so he's got a, he's got a fun accent. Uh, so the last one. And I'm sorry, this has taken a lot longer, but uh, I don't think I saw the second person, so I'm going to take my time. Oh. So for me, <laughs> it's... I work on the backwards <laughs> now for the wings. What's that? It's it moved to be Taylor, but but I think we're all into this, so don't cut it short. Oh, Back for me. No, no, please. Okay. I, we're we're asking questions. So, against the grain is the most aggressive. Um, if you're going to cut yourself, this is when you're going to do it. Um, but you've also removed a lot of the beard, so so it's it's um, this is the time to do against the grain. And for me, just because of the way it works, I start back down here on the neck. And you can see I'm kind of trying to pull it so that I, the skin doesn't catch and cut and then up and I'm kind of going fast. Turn it up and then up here. I've already shaved once today, so this is going to be like super smooth shape. And then, despite all this, there's probably, for me, it's right here, there's always yeah. going to be a little bit left over. So what I do is I take my brush, and I squeeze it, and I pull all that out of my brush. And now, you can take your hand, and you can kind of feel around 
and you'll feel it right there's a little bit more get a little bit of bonus shaving cream on there she wife always find those spots she's like you missed that it's those yeah. the indentations you always get a bad time about those indentations you missed yeah. and right there is always hard for me so there's little spots that that you learn that uh that you tend to miss okay so now you're done you got to take care of your razor rinse your razor if you've got a 70 year old razor you need to rinse it dry it off make sure it's in good shape don't ever do this always go down across that blade and hang it up and then rinse yourself off There's a few more steps. Post shave is important because this is a little harder on the skin. So I use warm water to clean up and rinse, but then this is important. And then you turn off the hot water, turn on the cold, let it get nice and cold. This is the man maker and do a cold rinse. <laughs> Okay. Then what I'll do is I'll turn the warm water back on and I'll stick the mug and the brush back down in there to start uh, cleaning that out. I'll come back and clean it up. There's a few options you have for post shave. One is called an alum block. And this, if you've ever, I know you use alum in cooking somewhere. Can't imagine right. why. It's pickles. Bitter. Pickles. It's Keeps pickling. them crisp. Okay. So this actually is just a block of alum. Um, so you dip this in the water. And then, oh yeah, I can feel that. This will let you know if you had any rough spots. This will let you know. Um, another tool you might have is a styptic pencil. This also stings, but if you have any bleeders, I don't, but we'll just pretend you dip that in the water and you get that on the bleeder and it'll, it'll stop the bleeding. Um, another option for me, I either use the alum block or I use witch hazel. And honestly, I use the witch hazel a lot more often than I do the alum block. Um, I don't know why, it's just easier. So there's a trick to doing this. You take, you do this with your hand. Put your, hold your thumb down in and your forefinger over and that creates a little pool down in here, a little bowl. And you pour the witch hazel down in there. And then you can get that on your neck all over your skin. And then I like to let this sit for a bit. So I'll take the opportunity to come down here and work the brush in the mug with the water. The key is that I wanna clean all that soap out of the brush. And then set that back in. And then here's the fun part for me. My brother's a soap guy. He's got enough soap to last him about three lifetimes. I'm an aftershave guy. I've only got I counted the other day, something between 25 and 30 aftershaves. Um, I just ordered 14 more. Um, <laughs> How many times time a day do you shave? shave? Only once. Oh, okay. Except t twice today. But uh, so, for example, here's my Sterling Gentleman. This one I like, and my wife likes it too. If I wear this, I can guarantee you Cher is going to snuggle up at some point because she wants to smell it. And that's why we do this, right? <laughs> um, this one here, old classic, Pinot Clubman. This uh, this smells like an old barbershop. It's your classic barbershop scent. So this is where I get to have a lot of fun. And you know what? I never understood when my wife stands and looks at a closet full of clothes and says, I have nothing to wear until one day I stood here 
and I looked at my shelf of two dozen aftershaves and said, man, I have nothing to wear. I don't know what I want to wear today. Um, so you put on your aftershave the same way you do the, the, the make your little bowl, be generous with it and, and put it all over the place. And then the key here is that we have cleaned out the brush. We, we, uh, kind of, uh, whip the water out of it in the sink and I'll actually walk over to the bathtub and do a full arm swing on it to get all the water out of it that I can because you want to take care of your brush so it'll take care of you. And then I kind of give it a couple passes on the towel, dry it out, and then I hang it up. I hang it up like this so that it will drip dry. And clean up your mess on the sink and that's it. That is how <laughs> You do traditional shaving. Good luck, your grandpa. So this, I mean, this would just be too weird. I don't know how this would work, but it feels like post-COVID, we need to get together and, you know, bring the right equipment. And, you know, when we gouge ourselves, when we get that angle wrong, we can get some real-time feedback. Um, do, you know, maybe make sure that everybody keeps their shirt on in case somebody has a camera, because that would be really weird to get that on YouTube. Um <laughs> But I mean, yeah, it just feels like it'd be good to, you know, it'd be great to get some real time, like, try this dangerous game. And yeah, it, oh. it really is fun. Last man um, standing, is that what they call that? Yeah, that's it. One of the challenges is, is that, you know, you could end up spending some money. Um, this guy here, I think I paid $55 for that razor. Um, it's, it's a very, very good razor. Um, these ones probably about the same price range, 35 to 50, even though, I mean, like I said, this one's 70 years old, but you can also get go, this guy, little Chinese made $10 razor, you know, so you could get into it, uh, pretty cheap too. Um, but it, it's fun because, you know, you, you get, uh, there's a, thousand and one different blades out there you know I, I mainly use this razor but there's I'll put five six different blades that I like that I'll alternate between the blades have different characteristics some are smoother some are sharper um, you know some I'll put a smoother blade in this because it's inherently more aggressive I'll put a sharper blade in this because the razor itself is inherently less aggressive um, you, you get to where you just experiment with all kinds of stuff. And if you're like me, you buy way too much. Um, but along those lines, Boyd, I do have some extra equipment that has never been used um, that I just hang on to with the intention of gifting it out someday. And I've got enough to take care of several of us. If anyone is interested in giving it a try, let me know and I'll gift you some uh, I'm going to wait. I'm going to take you up on it, but I want, I want to do it when we can do it together and get some, get some real time coaching. Okay, cool. How long does a soap last? That, that tub of soap? Oh, uh, let's see. It depends on how often you use it. Um, this one, it's, it's only 25% gone. I've had this six months at least. This one, I've had two or three years and, and it's almost gone. Um, this one, I've had the same time frame, but obviously don't use it as much. So if you use one soap every day, um, it'll probably last you three to six months. I only shave twice a week and, and I cycle through my soaps, whatever. I'll use one, two or three times and cycle to another. So, I mean, they last me years. Cool. So far, we have not finished off a soap that I recall. I finished off aftershaves, but I haven't finished off a soap yet. Thanks, Joe. That's amazing. Yeah. New insights, new world that didn't know existed. You need to do another one where you show us that straight edge uh, blade. Indeed. No kidding. This thing is hard. This thing, I mean, if it takes me 15 minutes to shave with, with a, a double edge 
razor, it'll take me a half hour to do two passes with this. And let me grab one without a blade. In. The, this thing is is tough because there's ways that you hold it. And then how do you get down in here? You know, you really do, you get to doing this sort of thing. And then like, if I wanna go across my neck, I'm, I still haven't figured out, uh, you know, you're like a mechanic, you need the third elbow. So your arm will bend a different way. But uh, these, <laughs> in fact, I think that, I don't know if you can see it. I've got a little, little scar right there. That's a remnant of this guy. He gave There you go, me. first hand. That's the price you pay to learn the lesson, to learn the craft. Yep, exactly. At least it was vertical and not across. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's also Tell this corn. There's also this guy. This guy's worthless. It'll cut butter if you warm it up first. Um, hmm. But you can you can go full straight edge razor. Uh, the problem is that these come with a, a responsibility of maintenance. You have to hone and strop it a lot, and I can't sharpen a pocket knife, so this just <laughs> sits dull. In fact, if anyone knows how to sharpen pocket knives well, I'd go for a tutorial on that. There you go. We'll add it to the list. So that's that. I'm going to quit talking, and... Uh, let us listen to Taylor. Andrew's a tool guy, but he's going to give us, I think next month he's up for, uh, he's up for drone, drone photography or we'd put him up to the knife sharpening given that he's a Milwaukee guy. Surely he knows how to sharpen a knife. I, I do use an electric uh, sharpener. <laughs> it's more like a belt sander. <laughs> okay, we'll get a demo someday. Right, William Taylor. All right. Um, I was just looking at the time. Do you guys want to keep going or? It depends on how you're set up. Um, I'm, I, I just have some slides that I put together and we can just Are you tight? About. If you're tight on time, we just do it next month. It depends on, on how good it is. If it's good, you can do it. If it's not good. <laughs> well, put it this way. If you wait a month, you'll be doing it with Andrew and that'll be an opportunity to show him up because he's, he's teed up for next month, but it's seriously up to you. We can we can go either way. Um, I, you're a studying man, so. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking about that. Um, it's like 10, 15 minutes. Is that all right? I mean, it's it's no presentation like Joe. Go for it. <laughs> all right. So let me see if I can make this all work. Tell me if you guys can. Uh, let's see. Yep. Yeah, sure. As long as somebody doesn't need to go to bed in the background, because we see the crib back there. So. Right. Well, that will be the will be the big issue. You guys can see this, right? Yeah. Yep. Let me get this running. Okay. So I titled this Poor Man's Art because uh, it's, it's not some interesting idea about what the poor man's art is or anything like that. No, this is um, drawing uh, on a budget. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've only used, you know, uh, a lot of times it was always pencils that I found and that kind of thing. And this is generally. Um, using uh, like sketching and also uh, doing ink work and that kind of thing. But um, I did go to school um, and my undergrad was in, um, it was uh, essentially the old general education degree with an emphasis in visual design. Um, and I took a class from a former member of the church um, who is an illustration professor over at Boise State. Um, and he's a phenomenal artist, of course, um, but he had some real kind of inspiring insights that he had that are kind of the main takeaways from this, um, this lesson for tonight. Um, and uh, these are the main ones. He first of all said, you should find an artist if you have any, any desire to do art better than whatever it is you're currently doing. He said to find an artist that you like and just try and copy their art. And I know, I know that to a lot of people, especially to artists, um, that always seems like, you know, the original sin is to say, well, I mean, it has to be your own original art. And he likened it to being a musician. And he said, but you wouldn't ever ask a musician just starting out to just, okay, write your own original music. And that's all you can write. 
He said, no, you need to be able to learn how other masters have put things together. Not even masters, just artists that you like. So he said, in fact, one of our assignments was find an artist that you like and just bring their stuff in and tell us why you like it. And it caused you to start looking at art in a more purposeful manner. And that's the second point down here. Um, and that was a real eye opener for me was to be able to look at others art. And um, that's actually something I'll still do as kind of a warm up is I'll find art that I like and find what's really kind of inspiring me and try and narrow down what's inspiring me about that art. Um, then as you move through it, you uh, um, get into pieces. Uh, the things that I'm focusing on a lot right now um, is you'll see a lot of portraiture. I have a lot of art in here, kind of showing a little bit of process, if you guys don't mind that. Um, but you focus, first of all, on large shapes and um, drawing real lightly to begin with. Um, and then you try and look purposefully. If you have a reference photo, and a lot of people will, um, you'll try and look back and forth as much as possible at things just to make sure that it feels right. And you'll see in a piece whether it's not feeling right or not, which is kind of one of the fun things about doing art is it's just kind of comes down to, well, this just doesn't feel like it's supposed to. And I'll show you on some of these pieces that just didn't feel right. And you'll see kind of the things that had to be altered to, to make it feel, feel right. Something else, which I think is a great lesson in life is that you're going to be really bad at things <laughs> and to be okay with that, to be okay with it. Like that, that is the process with art. It's always um, an issue because you think, oh, well, if I'm going to try it at my age, whatever your age is, that you think, well, I need to be a certain level or it's just not worth my time. And with art, it's just everybody is exposed to it. And so you can you can all see how bad things are, but it's a real humbling experience and it can be actually <laughs> nice to show it. But um, so not, you need to focus on the fact, and this was another piece from that um, art professor was that your all your art pieces aren't gonna be perfect. In fact, few of them will be perfect to your own standards. And when you look back, you'll be like, oh, well, you know, I guess there was that that I could have always tweaked on it. But each piece needs to push you. And what you'll find is that you'll, the moment that you start to actually feel a little bit of confidence in the art that you're doing, it'll start to scare you to try and do something different or to try and push a piece even further. And I'll show you that on another one of these. But you need to be able to get to that kind of scary place in the things that you're doing to be able to see it push even further and just think, okay, it's okay if this is bad. It's not a measure on me as a person. I'm just trying to get better and getting better is exposing yourself to things that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? Sharing the gospel, etc. Go ahead and use this however you'd like to. So, okay, so let me move on to some of this art then. So this is a, oh, can I, can you guys all see that? Are you yeah. missing the, at the end? I oh, know, move your, move your view around of the speakers if you need to, to see this process. Um, this is a this is a picture that I did for a buddy of mine, um, and this is a picture of his mother who um, who died of cancer, and so it was kind of a more personal piece. But I was doing it as a present, and he didn't know about it, so I could take as long as I wanted to, right? So it could be a Christmas present. Oh, now it's a birthday present. Oh, now it's uh, the next Christmas present, kind of a thing, as I was working through the process. But it was kind of high stakes because it was of his mother, and as you see over here, can you guys see my? Yep, he's fantastic. You can see over here. This is actually. Um, I started this, I really like this as a reference because this was a piece that I started prior to having taken that illustration class. And this was using just kind of basic know-how about drawing people. It was just you know, look at the picture and you just try and put it together, right? Um, as I, after I took, so this was actually in uh, 2014, 2013 or 14. Um, I jumped back into it actually in 2016 and you can kind of see the level of changes that I had as an artist. Um, but it involved being willing to spin the paper around, move the, move the reference image, which is a real interesting um, practice in itself. If you hold it upside down, you'll see balances in the composition that you didn't see before in the reference images, um, which actually helps it to feel more like it's supposed to. And you can see how, again, big shapes try to, I personally like to really make sure that the eyes look like they're in the right place first, eyes, nose, you can usually work around with the mouth and you'll see that on another one. But I like to get in there first. So then you're like, oh, those eyes look right. Because for some reason, eyes, they'll always, they'll always get you in the end. <laughs> but so there's this one. Let me uh, flip to the next. Here's one actually that um, I did while I was up here. Um, I thought that I was kind of getting it right here in the beginning and I couldn't figure out what the issue was until I got to, you know, later on, I realized, oh, she looks like a child for some reason. 
And I realized it was because um, her face was too round. It wasn't long enough as it was supposed to be. But I, um, this is one of those issues you'll get into where you think, oh, well, I really liked what I did here. I don't want to erase it. I don't want to mess with it because I got it kind of just right. Well, if you have to balance out, well, I mean, am I willing to just say, okay, well, this is a subpar piece or am I going to like push myself into that kind of scary place and erase it like I did perform major surgery here and try and fix it? Well, as you can see here, this is really light. Um, but I even got the dimensions kind of wrong again and had to go back in and re-erase it and change it back up. But in the end, from here to here, you can see the ideas that, oh, well, the, the result then in the end was worth it. You know, to be able to say, okay, well, I took that extra time. I was willing to push myself into kind of a scary place where I said, well, I'm, I'm willing to put in the extra time and just sacrifice whatever pride that I had and thinking that, oh, well, it was what I got to right here with these little um, elements. I really liked it, but now I'm willing to just sacrifice it to try and get kind of to this result. And if you're willing to stay with it, you're, you'll get a better result in the end. Did you have a question, Rex? Oh, I can't hear you. My bad, I muted myself. Um, so is this, you, you were literally erasing and redrawing or are you starting over with a whole new sheet of paper? No, I was, um, and that's kind of what you find. That's why you want to go um, as light as possible. I, I really deal only with the H pencils. I don't know if you guys know between H and B pencils. Um, H actually has to do with the hardness of the tip, the hardness of the graphite. And that actually makes it lighter. B stands for, I believe the term is just black. <laughs> and it's just, that's where it gets darker. And that's harder to erase. And you have to kind of find good papers that you like to work with and things. And, um, but if you use the H pencils, you can take them off real easy. So I like to lay in a lot of pieces first and just make sure that the elements are working well together. And then I'll go even darker. Um, but again, that's the process I go through. So yeah, I just... Made sure, and I mean, it looked this crude when this like this big erasure mark out of the middle, and this one looked as bad as well. But okay, so this is um, one that I did for a return missionary cousin of mine. Um, I had this reference photo, and it just I don't know, like the composition just didn't sit well with me, and so it just was I'd say okay, maybe in the end, maybe just the composition isn't working right. It just doesn't feel right. So I went to this one, um, and as you can see, the paper, the tonal value on the paper is different. Um, I found this kind of gray paper. It's uh, these are like five dollars. The toned gray. Get them down at uh, Michaels, or you can get them at Hobby Lobby. Either one. But um, I really like those just because you could bring out some real cool whites as part of the elements in there. Mm. But again, this is one where I laid in all the pieces first to make sure that the composition looked right then really worked on the eyes and mouth and got those balances, then darkened it in this kind of interesting background around it. So the, did you actually switch photos from first to second or did yep. you just take the first as a reference and, and re change the uh, smile? Or anything? No, I'm, I'm not that cool. <laughs> um, but I did use that first reference to make sure, especially with uh, if you're looking at different um, resolution types on pictures, um, you'll notice that the eyes will kind of start to blend together their elements. So if you actually use two different references, you can see kind of generally the way that the eyelids look together and kind of really what their iris looks like. Make sure you can get some of those elements in there that will really stand out to people like their parents who would really know. You know? And also, you'll see that like I like to do like a hard stroke around the outside of things, like just a real thick black line. That's just a preference it's you know you'll find those little things that you really like again I picked it up from another artist I just really liked how that felt in the end here's one you can see kind of the design elements as they were coming in around it and I went back and forth on what I wanted to do and then it's like thought, oh okay this is kind of working together darkened it all up even more kill Batman <laughs> um, this is one that I did recently um really like the way that kind of busts ended up looking on that tonal paper and especially with this kind of a composition where you can really get some of that bounce light um, back in here to show the show the elements of kind of like the statue but you can see here that i'm had like some straight lines across you can see this line down the center of the face to make sure that the pieces were kind of bouncing off that line correctly as kind of like a center mass to build everything off of um, i really like the way the face turned out and that's why i zoomed it in up here that you can see 
kind of these other lights, one that I put in with white and the white was used kind of real um, judiciously throughout in a lot of this to let like the value of the paper come through and then just use like white on the highlights and kind of smudge through. But also um, on smudging, like a lot of this around the very outside is smudged, but throughout I make sure that I have like individual strokes in there. And that is a real preference. That's a real preference for, you know, different people that you'll find. It doesn't look entirely smooth throughout, but I really like the way that this looks. And that just is, you know, preference for, you know, the artists that you like and things that you'll start to find as you. That is really amazing, actually. That really jumps off the page. That looks literally like a bust. That is cool. <laughs> Thank you. Do you. Does anyone know who this is? It was our fourth Supreme Court Justice for the United States, Chief Justice. It's Chief Justice Marshall. He had a real legal piece to play. And I actually did this for our constitutional law professor um, when Concordia University School of Law went under. I did several portraits um, or several, I did a bust and then several portraits of mentors for um, some of the professors who I, who really kind of helped me along in, in my legal process. So it's been pretty cool. But this was one for our constitutional law professor. How long does it take you to do a piece like this? Um, so what was really cool is I've, I've now actually gotten it down. I wanted to show you on the last one. So I'm going to hold that question here to the end. I know I'm just a little bit over on time. But um, so here's a Marcus Aurelius that I did last Christmas. And it was where I was really starting to toy with that, um, that type of composition, really bringing those, those darks around it, so the highlights bounced a lot better, especially up here on the face, as you can see. Oh, and I apologize if that's just a little bit grainy picture. Anyway, um, I've done some other compositions with wildlife, but really um, like portraiture a little bit better. I think this is where I get into some other things that I've tried. Oh, this is, um, if you guys know this story from the Book of Mormon, I actually did this for a competition this summer. Um, didn't like the end result and neither did the competition either. This is actually, this is Tiankum Slain Amalekaya. It's awesome. Yeah, and so while he and his men slept, um, and I believe this was, um, I can't remember the title of the piece, it was clever, but Tiankum and his right-hand man are there in the, um, in the tent, and just a lot of the pieces that kind of went into this were really, really kind of cool for me. That is cool. But this is one, you know, really leaning into um, ink work as well, um, have just kind of a penchant for it, and you find things that you really like, and, and you just kind of go from there. This is something else that I've done is kind of, uh, I will start off, uh, especially if anything ends up being kind of what they call like vectorized or turn into, this is actually an um, uh, illustration I did for a banner on a friend of mine's YouTube page that they just paid me for. Um, and this one I actually got through in a day. Um, I did this illustration first and he approved of it and then converted it from this to this. And I think about seven hours total or something like that. But there's elements in here that I really like and have really kind of uh, pushed the things that I want to do kind of as an artist. And not to say that, you know, just doing portraits is what you have to do or, you know, just doing kind of silly cartoony art is something you have to do. But you can do, you know, the white gamut. I mean, the principles are all the same, which is really cool because study of um, being able to look intentionally, look purposefully helps you to find these other elements that other people were finding in nature. And as you're looking at their art, you can identify those as well and what makes these elements in here kind of stand out and what you need to add or take away from this other stuff. Like you can see little light green lines and stuff like that in here that really just kind of changes it. So here's another example of other things, character type development. This is a, this for a, a couple of friends of ours that we all really like Harry Potter and we also really like to lift weights. And so it's Hermione Ganger. She's all about getting them gains. I have a, I have a brawn Weasley as well. And, <laughs> and <laughs> Harry Squatter. <laughs> Harry Squatter, actually. Yeah, the boy who lifted. Yeah, it's it's kind of thing. <laughs> and Lord Swoldemort. <laughs> Lord Swoldemort. Oh, that's well done. <laughs> uh, you're going to chime with another one, Andrew? I, I, was, I was just waiting for the follow on. That was pretty good. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't even know if I can name another character from Harry Potter. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, um, so here was a portrait that I ended up doing for my grandfather and um, this is actually several that I have done now is um, this is one that I did digitally and you can see the 
just the quality on it. I don't like it as much now looking back at it. And this is one of those things where you can say, oh, well, hmm, if I could go back and do it again, maybe I will do it a different way. And this is as I was doing more portraiture. Um, this is actually one that I copied right from a picture that he had. In fact, this was his you know, inscription on it. And this was actually used at his funeral. Um, but I, I tried to just trace it digitally. And then, um, but if you trace anything, you'll realize that there's certain things that you need to do with line weight to make things kind of jump out. And what do you do with shading? And what do you, there's all these other choices that you still have to make, even if you're going to try and trace something. But I really like the effect in the end. And again, something that I'll probably go back and change in the next one. Here's some just other paintings, same principles as well. Um, actually, don't you have a copy of this, Rex? No, uh, I have the samurai. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I actually don't have that one on here. But yeah, good old John Wayne. I uh, was selling these before. Uh, this is one that I did as a private commission for a buddy of mine in law school. Um, famous painting of George Washington. And this actually, he ended up, we put it onto a canvas. So it actually looked like it was a painting and it looks like the painting, which was, which was really fun. Especially to get some of these other little details, the beads in here, some of these little light elements, his frills through here to make those look just right. It's really cool. That's what always amazes me about art is just the amount of detail and the patience that it must take. Well, the... <laughs> you find a lot of patience in yourself trying to say, okay, I'm kind of messing something up right here. Okay. I need to just walk away from it or I need to go to a different element that I can kind of work on and then to try and come back and, you know, finesse things or just erase it again and, you know, read, you know, go back and do it again. But this is the final one that I did. And um, I bring this one up um, not only because I really like it, but this actually is about my process because um, I did this one um, on a Sunday afternoon. And I can do these all just pretty much in about three or four hours. Hmm. And that's where, um, that's kind of, that was a goal that I had really wanted for myself was to be able to do these pretty quickly. And that's kind of my measure for pretty quickly um, is to be able to just do it in kind of an afternoon. And so this is actually what I do on my Sundays um, while the kids will be playing and some of the other things that we'll be doing. I can usually find some time where I'll usually, um, I don't have a you know, set art place or anything like that. Um, so I'll usually do it at the kitchen counter and I'll just do art there at the kitchen counter and, you know, we'll talk with the kids and kids will sometimes draw and we'll um, listen to music and things. And it's just really nice, but um, I wanted to get down to about this pace. And this is actually one of our sitting judges right now. His name is Judge Schilling. Um, if any of you know him, you don't have to reveal that you know him or why you know him as a judge. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I've actually, um, I've started doing these pieces for um, sitting judges and attorneys in the area um, as part of uh, an organization that I, belong, that I belong to with my law school. And there's, they have kind of like a spotlight attorney or a judge every month. And so I offered to do these for them and I've been able to just kind of churn them out pretty quick. And this is at least the first one that I've done and I'm just kind of giving away his gifts. So. You're, you're sure it's not community service? <laughs> of that and go ahead and ask me if it's uh, also not you know a great way to build rapport and uh, <laughs> i was gonna say taylor's, taylor's playing the long game here he's looking for judgment in the future um 100 guys <laughs> um and something that i found for myself which is um which has really been cool is that art has always just been a has been just an escape for me I tried to work as a graphic designer for about two years um, and just wasn't, wasn't that great as a graphic designer. And as I prayed about it and I've, I've worked at it and things, I've found that it's just kind of this nice little break that I can sometimes take. And sometimes, uh, you know, something that really can like help me to be fortified for the other things that I need to do. And that's why I can usually do it on a Sunday. And uh, um, yeah, it's been just really cathartic and it's just been a real blessing as you know, I've only, so I now only work on art just once a week and I usually do a student on Sunday and um, just do it with the kids there. And it's just been kind of nice for all of us. So yep, there you go. I know not as elaborate as Joe's, but almost the same amount of time. <laughs> oh, that awesome. is super impressive though, Taylor. I've always been really impressed with your talent. Um, I'm, I'm glad you said what you did about uh 
trying to be a graphic designer because I kind of did the same thing with photography. I used to love photography. And then I went into a career in photojournalism and it just absolutely killed it. I haven't hardly even touched a camera in almost 20 years and haven't missed it because it took something that I loved and turned it into a chore. So I'm, I'm, I'm super glad that you kept this as a passion. Yeah. And just as a fun pastime. And again, if um, I love to talk about it, I love to um, do other things involved with art. And so if, if any of you guys have a, have a desire to do other art like this, I mean, and I don't think that this is also you know, like real top tier or anything like that. I've only been doing it like to any of this type of degree for just a couple of years. I know there's a lot of people have been working at a lot longer than I have, but if there's anybody that, you know, wants to talk about it more, if you want to do more with it or anything like that, just let me know. Thanks Taylor. Very nice. Thank you both. Yeah, very nice. That was this amazing. has been this has been well worth my time personally. Super awesome. I think others yeah, would feel thanks, the same. Guys. So very lightning evening. Thank you. I feel like with with just being six of us, 